Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Power Monkey Podcast. On this episode, Chad and I interview three-time Olympian Cheryl Hayworth. Cheryl's also a bronze medalist from the 2000 Games in Sydney. On this episode, we go into some really interesting ideas about what has happened with the Olympic Games this summer, the changes coming from 2020 in Tokyo and having to make the change to 2021 because of COVID-19. Cheryl goes into some really interesting ideas about what it have done to her in her training when she was an athlete back in the 2000s. I think you guys are going to really like this episode. Check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Power Monkey podcast. We're here today with Cheryl Hayworth, three-time Olympian. We felt like she was the most appropriate individual to get on since she's been there three times, one more time than me, actually, and she makes sure that everyone knows that um, as we're on the (laughs) USA Weightlifting podcast together all the time. But we're going to talk today about the postponement of the Olympic Games. And I have to tell both of you guys with how long it took us to get this recording actually going, (laughs) I kind of felt that a little bit, right? How these athletes and these coaches must be feeling. We're about 30 minutes uh, late here going back and forth. So can kind of understand uh, how they're feeling there. But Cheryl, thank you for joining us. Sure. Well, that's what you have. Uh, That's what you get when you get me on the podcast. Delays. (laughs) <laughs> As we know, you and I have now done 70 USA Weightlifting podcasts up to this wow. point. Has look it been that today, many? It's been 70. And yes, every single time, it's Cheryl's fault. There's something wrong. That goes, no, <laughs> it's not always her fault. Actually, most of the time, it's probably probably my fault. There's some sort of delay. So that's from, even from... more embarrassing, Dave, when he's actually tallied up how many podcasts we've right, done together. Right. And I'm like, uh, I got these headphones, and then I got these from the Xbox. Yeah. He's like, yeah, wait yeah. a second, what? what? Don't you Cheryl's know? Like, are you sure it's not only like two? Like, I thought we've only done two, right? <laughs> yeah, you're a pro by now. <laughs> I got like a little empty vegetable can tied to a string tied to the computer. Whatever so Dave, works. you... You may have to actually remind us every now and then that we're not on the USA Weightlifting Podcast. I will do my best. Here, I will we, do my best. You know, yeah. um, although I do think Please, that sir. we should have Thank you on. You. I've been thinking about that almost since we started the USA Weightlifting Podcast, Dave, and I think now is a, kind of a good time, so we'll, we're going to think of uh, of a way to get you on. I think it would be great for you to hear from you just in regards to my you know, PRs, talking about my, my, my your PRs. PRs. Absolutely. Sure. Hey, hey God, here's I what I'm going to say, it. Dave. Your squat is – above and beyond what a lot of Olympic lifters that I see these days are because Thank you. you've actually lifted into us as the Power Monkey weightlifting coaches and you follow those full range of motion standards. So that's oh, very good. But yeah. But yeah, absolutely. But I think Hey, I've seen good. you lift weights, man. It's 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 pretty it's nice. It's good. It's you know, something, you're isn't it? It's <laughs> something else. <laughs> you definitely lift the weight. Uh, no, that's you know, that's you probably the best compliment I can ever get. Yeah. There you are weights. How to, yeah, you understand how to move your body. You're you're a good athlete, and and you get the job done very well. And I and I'm mostly only saying that day because you have beat me in a couple of barbell workouts. So I've got to give you some some. Yeah, sort of under therapy. under 100 pounds with a lot of reps, I can I can probably take Chad Vaughn. That's about it. Yep. Well, hey, before we get into works, <laughs> before we get whatever too far works. into the topic, Cheryl. Now we're on video. I, I had to give Cheryl a. a you know, three or four hour heads up that we're actually going to be on video because we don't currently do video on uh, USA Weightlifting. So I knew that she was going to have to shave a little bit, you know, to right. take, actually go right. go take uh-huh. a bath. And to, and to be honest, to be honest, this yeah, is, Yeah, I was you know, in my b- boudoir uh, powdering my nose. Yeah. Right, right before that four hours was just <laughs> enough time that I needed, Chad. Yeah, that's, I, I knew it would be. Right up. I knew it would be because in quarantine, my only motivation once a week to take a to take a shower, to take a bath, is because of the Power Monkey podcast. I got to shave a little bit, make sure that my my stubbles over here aren't uh, aren't showing too much. This is as good as I get right here. This hey, that looks good. Nasty though. beard I, going. Hey, at least it's not all patchy like Chad. Exactly. That <laughs> we were just which, talking about like a little tuft here, a little tuft here. <laughs> just another reason that Dave makes me feel so inadequate as a man. Just you know, that's that's one more. Although uh-huh. I will say we have a question for her later that I'm excited to get to, but that's going to oh, come of much later. No, I'm so bad at those questions. This is not it's not the question game like on the weightlifting podcast because I just we're, go. We're gonna, we'll do uh, a little question game. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll do a little question game. You'll you I think you'll be able to answer the first one. Hopefully, you'll really be able nervous. to answer that answer that pretty well. But I was going to remind you, Cheryl. Now 
I'm going to tell off on you here, but I want to make sure that you don't need to go to the bathroom before we get started here, because what happens on the you know? USA Weightlifting <laughs> podcast, because we don't have video, she's able to mute. Go go to the uh, bathroom. Just let me talk. Do all the talking. Chad, I 100%. I, my first thought when you said video, I said it's going right. to be so much harder to mute it and go pee <laughs> yeah. while everything's happening. Not that you wouldn't do it. It's just going to be harder. It's just going to be harder. I'm like, I need to stay. I'll get the dog and set the dog here to be <laughs> She's way cuter than me, so I think it could work out. Cheryl we'll try to keep unwilling. it short enough. <laughs> She's unwilling to be uncomfortable, so she will. I I would not put it past her uh, to go do that. But every now and then, I'll be I'll right. say something, and I'll expect her to ask the next question or to <laughs> conversate with me. And there's like a 10, 15 right. second delay. She's like, "Oh, you know." Later, she tells me that she. And was I'm like again. jogging back from the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it took it like seventy lot, podcasts actually. for you to realize. Okay, when I don't hear anything, I know where Cheryl's it, at. It, Exactly, right. <laughs> exactly. But yes, we're, we are digging into the postponement of the Olympic Games. They've now been announced that they're in 2021. And I can't even imagine as an athlete, you know, what that must feel like, um, you know, how they're going to handle that situation. A, a pretty much a full in, entire another year. Uh, the only a, a big bonus of that is that if I'm trying to go to the 20, 2024 Olympic Games as well, now I only have to wait three years instead of four, so that's kind of a, a bonus there. But Cheryl, being that you've been to three Olympics, and I want to talk about the your latest one, which is 2008. Um, and let me remind you how long ago that was, Cheryl. That that was 12 years ago now uh, for all of us. Uh, all three of us were there. But 2008, what would you have done in this position? How would you have felt? What would you have thought? How would you have handled it? In 2008, specifically, right. um, I would have popped the champagne <laughs> and prayed to everything and everyone, mm -hmm. um, you know, my gratitude that it was delayed because I was, in, I was in pretty poor shape leading into that competition. I was recovering from an injury and it took better than a year and a half, almost two years to figure out what was even going on. And uh, by the time I had it figured out and really could train, because what you do when you're hurt and it's a mystery, you're, you're trying to train just as much as your body can really tolerate, right? And then something hurts a little too much, you back off, you do the physio, um, you get all the opinions you can get, you, you just throw the kitchen sink at it, you're doing everything you can think of train a little bit, not getting better, back away again. So it was just doing that over and over again, mm -hmm. which is really tiresome. But we figured out that it was my, my lower back. I had a few epidurals. Pain went away. Okay, we can train. But I, I, that was six months out. You know what I mean? Right. I, I passed on the world champ. No, not the world championship the year before, but the Pan Am Games the year before because I was hurt couldn't resolve the issue. So I let another one of our teammates go um, because I didn't, I didn't want to keep spinning my wheels. So I, I think I crammed like three solid years of training into like six mm -hmm. months. Right. And, you know, as you know, people at the top of your sport, uh, Dave, you're included, obviously is that you can't, you simply can't do that. You'll, even if you're talented enough, to still like I still managed to qualify and get on the team um but it was just I knew that I was just going and just gonna see it like let's just see what happens I knew it was going to be a poor performance because I simply just wasn't prepared and there's nothing you can do at that point to play catch up you can't make up the difference of years and years of accumulated squatting for example um so I would have been happy uh, frankly, to get the delay. Now, that being said, the other the other instances leading into the games, my attitude would have been uh, a little bit different. I mm -hmm. think I was well prepared for those events and looking forward to them. And so I guess it really probably just does depend on what kind of a training situation an athlete finds him or herself in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... I guess I guess that's it. It just yeah. really depends. But that's how I would have felt before 2008 for sure. I would have been so happy. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think there's going to be some some mixed reactions here, and I do think that some athletes will end up, and in the end, we're, we're never going to know what they would have done in 2020, but I think some athletes will end up performing better than they would have, and some athletes will be drugged down uh, a little bit and, and wish, hey, man, I was more ready you know, there in 2020, and, and I think I could have potentially performed better, but as far as 2008 goes, I can relate to what you're saying for sure. I would have gladly taken another year. I tell you what, for me, for everyone on, on the U.S. weightlifting team in 2008, it was such an emotional year to battle and, and make the team for a lot of different reasons, and for you, Cheryl, uh, due to the injury and everything else, but the whole, you know, Casey Bergner situation that we that we won't get into, but thinking that we had um, you know, more spots than we did and him going to the games and that being taken away from him uh, while, while he was there. It was it was such an, an emotional um, uh, process to make that Olympic Games for me. And going into that during training, I've it almost felt, the best way I can describe it is that it almost felt like my superpowers were taken away, like my strength. I just could not move, you know, even 90 to 80, 85 to 90% um, felt like I had PR weight on the on the on the bar when I was in training, and specifically my squat and deadlift and pressing strength were just zapped out of me. And I finally started to feel like I was coming around the week before I was supposed to compete um, uh, there there in Beijing. So I would have gladly taken another year, another week, even if if they would have given it to me. But thinking about 2004, it was different. I was so excited. I uh, first Olympic team. Um, I felt really strong, really prepared, really ready. So that would have that would definitely have been a little bit more of a bummer. And I'm not sure um, how I would have handled that mentally and emotionally and uh, and physically. Dave, on your end, what are your thoughts there about 2008 and your specific situation? Yeah, I, I would have been devastated. Uh, I would have been crushed if that would have happened because I was already kind of at the end of my. Uh, my kind of uh, run as a gymnast, I was very much kind of planning for what 20, 2009 was going to look like. Uh, I was, you know, had certain things already set up, uh, leaving the Olympic Training Center and moving on to the next phase of my life. And I had kind of like prepared everything for that one moment. And, you know, my, my knees were shot. I knew I'd have knee and knee surgeries. I knew I'd have ACL repairs. I had to have all these things done after, you know, Beijing, after getting back. So if I was told that I had to wait another year, it would have completely crushed me. I don't, I don't know if I would have been able to stick around for another year. Mm -hmm. And I probably would have done it just because, you know, you don't train right. that whole time uh, to kind of give up on another year. But I don't think it would have uh, benefited me uh, as it might someone else who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, might say, hey, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm injured, whatever, this extra year is going to give me a benefit to kind of get things mm -hmm. in place as it, as it did you, Cheryl, maybe for 20, 2008. Well, that's a great point. I haven't even thought about it from that perspective. I mean, there are some, there are going to be a good number of athletes that are on the older side of their prime. And it, a year, when you're that close to the end of your prime, like you said, Dave, is a long time. I was already so, the old man on the team. Yeah, I was the old man on the team in right. 2008. I was 28 years old. That would have put me almost yeah. at 30 years old. Uh, that that's as a, for a gymnast. That's you know that's almost ancient. So um, mm -hmm. and like yeah, you said, Charlotte, that's like, a thing. Yeah, I don't. I didn't have the talent to kind of compete against those young guys. So it's not like I was relying on on talent. It was just like slog away, you know, chip away piece by piece. And uh, at almost 30 years old, that would have been a real struggle. Yeah. And it's a snap, it's a snapshot in time, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, a very measured out thing that we've all agreed on every four years that this thing's going to happen barring world war. And it's, it seems like this, it's this immovable thing. And once you, uh, you know, once that's not a sure thing anymore, it's, it can, it can all seem like chaos. You know, there are these two group or more than two groups of people but i think maybe those are the two extremes those people who are like this all i got left in my body mm -hmm. are the next few months yeah whereas you have people who just want that reprieve and says you know thank you please let me just give me a year of training uh without hurting myself and and that's the thing too is it's an opportunity for for a weightlifter for example to get stronger 
over a year's time, but it's also an opportunity for things to go wrong Mm -hmm. over a year's time. And I think the trick will be how, you know, how emotionally the athlete obviously handles it in, and to not really change too much. I think that's going to be really important going over the next year is not, okay, I'm on the Olympic team, things have to get more intense or what have you, when really I think people should just uh, change as little as possible. Maybe make yeah. some tweaks here, make some adjustments now that they do have the time. Uh, but wholly should really just be sticking to their original game plan. Yeah, especially if it ain't broke, don't fix it um, kind of thing. So you know, maybe we'll dig into that a little bit more on the weightlifting and the gymnastic side here in a little bit. But I was really thinking a lot about this um, basically ever since it was announced that it was going to be postponed so much. And what is the mo- the most difficult part in this? And what is the most tragic part of this? And it kind of goes to with what Dave was saying, someone that's, you know, towards the end of their career, are they going to be able to hold on for another year? And another thing too, that hasn't really been decided, I don't believe really for, for many or any sports is that are they going to have to go through a requalification process just in regards to who's on the team from these specific countries. And and to me, the most tragic thing is for weightlifting, for example, the team had been basically selected. Uh, we were talking to Phil Andrews, the, the, the CEO, and, you know, the last recording that we did with him, which was about three or four weeks ago now, he spit out the names of the athletes that had been confirmed on the team. There were no more qualifying meets. The, the Olympics were still... Um, on at that time, although they were having those discussions, but to know that you were on the team and then for an- another qualification process to have to take place because it's another year later and for you not to make that team, that would be incredibly hard to take. I actually, I don't even like thinking about being the athlete in that situation because it, it brings some, some sad, uh, emotions, some, some difficult emotions to, to deal with, do you guys see that happening, uh, Cheryl, in, in weightlifting and, and then Dave on the gymnastics side? I mean, you you know the qualification process there. Is, is that potential? Uh, is that a potential to happen in gymnastics as well? Um, Chad, I I feel I felt the feeling that you described, like in my gut, and mm-hmm. putting myself in the shoes of somebody who qualified and then having to re-qualify something happens or you just don't hit your numbers for that day. I, it, it, it's very upsetting. Um, I don't, I don't know as an athlete if I would ever recover Mm -hmm. from that sort of a thing emotionally. And so I think in my opinion that whomever was named, you know, like for example, we, we had that conversation with Phil uh, if that is the Olympic team, it should remain the Olympic team, uh, despite maybe some progress that's made over the next year, because after all, that's what the next Olympics are for. You know, if you're if you're stronger um, in 2021 than you were in 2020, great, shoot for 2024. I think these athletes who have locked on or, or their NGBs or, you know, however it works, decide that this is our Olympic team, it, sh- it should we should freeze frame that and and maintain uh, those folks on the Olympic team. In my opinion, I don't, I think that would be too much like moving the goalposts. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I I don't think that should happen. I really hope that, you know, it can happen in the way that you're describing, but the, the tough part about this is that it's a full year. And especially we were talking to Phil about this as well. We have so many talented athletes, young up and coming athletes that are right in position right there with these other guys and close to making the Olympic team already. And if you look at them a year ago, they were nowhere close. So another year, you know, some of these other athletes could take over and be stronger and more prepared to go to the Olympic games. And in the end, you want your best team. You want your strongest individuals, but you know, so it's, it's really tough. I mean, I can see both sides of it. Um, And it's almost like, you know, this is something that no one can control it's almost like if they don't end up going, you know, should they be named an Olympian anyway, you know? I um yeah. I had read somewhere that uh the IOC 
was recommending that if qualification had already taken place and team members were named, that they would need to be named for 2021. They would need Mm -hmm. to remain in place. Now, I don't know if that's certain or not, but I did read somewhere that the IOC was recommending that to NGBs, Mm -hmm. where if they were already have had already gone through all the qualification process and had been named to that team, that they would remain for 2021. But uh, I don't know if that's either been confirmed or if NGBs are actually adopting that. Um, I really hope. Yeah. I was going to say, I really hope that's the case because I can, as you were describing that, Dave, I was, you know, envisioning myself being that athlete in that situation where I'm over a year out. I mean, they have what, um, a year and 14, 15 months. Mm -hmm. before the scheduled Olympic Games. And if I knew that that far in advance, I could have a longer period of time to accept that, to see myself as an Olympian, to understand that I deserve to go, to know that I'm locked into that team and to be able to train with more relaxation for a longer period of time. So I see a big advantage in that. And I think because of that advantage that I see and that I felt when you were describing that, it makes me hope that that's the case even more. Yeah, I want, I want to just make one point on that. I think you're exactly right. So uh, during the gymnastics process, you know, we don't have our Olympic trials until very close to the Olympic Games. Uh, they're normally done. They were supposed to be at the end of June, uh, where they're normally at the end of June, which is actually always my uh, birthday week was always Olympic trials. Mm-hmm. And we would leave, you know, six to eight weeks after that. Uh, so it was always done to kind of like, you know, limit the potential for injuries and to make sure people were peaking at the right time. But there was always a lot of discussions being had behind closed doors, especially on the the men's side, which I know a little bit more about than the women's side. But um, to have conversations about trying to consider picking the team six, eight, ten months prior Mm, and give those guys the opportunity to train together for almost a full year and to create a bond. And, you know, this – We're both individual sports, weightlifting and gymnastics, but on the gymnastics side, we form our team, the squad that goes to the Olympics, based upon not the individual, but on how they perform as a team. So for as much as we're an individual sport, it's more important to be a strong team than it is a strong individual. So, you know, we've considered in the past, what are the benefits to selecting your Olympic team a year ahead of time? Are there any benefits to being able to train, know that you're on the Olympic team, name that Olympic coach, train together for an entire year, learn the ins and outs in terms of um, how you guys optimize your particular routine, uh, what every other team member can do to help that person uh, optimize that that routine in that particular situation. And there was a lot of discussion about the benefits that go along with with picking the team that far out. So while there's a lot of negatives – in, in everything going on. I do mm-hmm. think that if you pick the team that far out, that there's going to be, especially in team aspect in a team sport where you give that, that ability to create cohesiveness. I think there's a lot of benefit to, um, for an athlete and for a team to be able to pick that far out. So there, there could be some positives. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really good point, Dave and, and weightlifters sort of do the same thing as using one another for, uh, for fuel, yeah. you know, it, it has its its downfalls. Of course, Chad, you talk sometimes about um, group training and how it can really drain you and and cause you to to push a little harder than you need to at times. Um, you know, but but I think our weightlifting team could certainly benefit from feeling that that safety that they are in fact on the team, uh, and what a huge stress relief that would be, and to simply just kind of hit the reset button, say, okay, team, here we go. Everybody stay safe, but this is, you know, put the X on the day that you lift next year and and shoot for that. And I think more broadly, too, speaking to the whole situation, Dave, you mentioned the IOC making that recommendation. I think as long as it's across the board. So, for example, if Team USA says, okay, you know, we've decided who's going to be on the Olympic team as if it were 2020. The, here are our teammates or, or our team members for 2021. As long as everyone did that, I don't think anybody, any one athlete has the advantage over another getting mm-hmm. back to, well, maybe a younger kid is stronger and maybe could perform better internationally, perhaps. But I would argue that's what 2024 is for. And, and also there's no, I don't think anybody can cite 
unfairness in any real way if if everybody's held to the same standard. Yeah. So everybody names their Olympic team. This is it, barring anything crazy. But again, that's what alternates are for. Um, and, and hoping that it will work out. But it's it's definitely kind of the wait and see for these athletes it has to be very, very stressful. Yeah, I can completely yeah. agree with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's say Cheryl being, again, I'm a, I'll am say it again, three-time Olympian, right? Um, yes. all the ex- I love right. it when Chad says that. Uh, it sounds so I know, sweet you coming, know, and coming out of your mouth. When, I, when <laughs> we were first doing the USA Weightlifting Podcast, it hit me in the gut every time I had to say that. So I've accepted it. You know, through the last couple of years, I'm I'm okay with it now. I feel good about it finally. But um, with grace, you know, with all the experience that you have and you've done a lot of coaching um, up to this point, if you had an athlete that would that had qualified for the 2020 Olympic Games that is in this exact situation, you've got over a year left before the next Olympic Games, and whether they're you know confirmed on the team or whether they have to requalify, what do you do? What do you do with them? Um, that's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. I I think I had sort of touched on it just a little bit earlier, um, about if from my perspective that it, it would be really important not to change too much. Um, I feel like a lot of athletes and we know this from, um, we spoke to a psychologist uh, a week or so ago. Um, it's, it's really easy for them to, or everybody really, we're all experiencing this being at home that with those weird expressions of anxiety, um, that we have, I, I know top athletes are oftentimes, um, a personalities and, and feel like they need to do more. So I think my, my number one goal would be to not only to reassure my athlete, but, but also say that, you know, what we've been doing so far has been working. Uh, hopefully you're an Olympic team member, uh, depending on what happens over the next couple of weeks or what they decide, but we do, we need to keep uh, the course. We need to mm-hmm. stay the course and and not feel like we need to do anything just out of sheer anxiety. Uh, mm-hmm. The second thing that I would do is, I think possibly psychologically, probably a pretty good thing to maybe go ahead and mark off on the calendar uh, a date maybe near or on when we were going to compete anyway, Mm -hmm. just to kind of let off some steam. And I I imagine that um, in GBs, I I foresee USA weightlifting doing something similar in, in many, um, many other athletes across the globe sort of staging their own Mm -hmm. safe uh, in their own little bubbles or however they want to do it, but sort of mimicking that, um, and getting the community involved, you know, yeah. saying, Hey, we're, we're acknowledging that this was a moment in time that you were supposed to have. It's been delayed and really just showing some support. So I, I would really encourage, even in a small way, um, I would have my athlete do that just to, you know, uh, keep your chin up sort of a thing. And again, I don't, I don't want to answer too long, but, but really just do everything that we had been doing up to that point. And just have a lot of discussion. Keep the communication open, uh, and and just really make sure that they're doing everything they can to stay safe. And because uh, I think things are changing moment to moment, we're mm-hmm. all looking at the news daily. You know, for the, for example, today the governor of Georgia finally uh, issued a you know shelter in place order. So so daily athletes are experiencing challenges. For example, I think I think a lot of lifters in Georgia were still. Mm-hmm able to access their gyms and they can't anymore. So there are all these negotiations that we're having to make day to day and maybe not set too many things in stone. I think it'll be really easy to say, Oh, it'll it'll be okay. in four months we'll be fine. Everything will be back to normal. Well, what if that doesn't happen? You know, and, but I think it's healthy for athletes. We talk about this a lot, Chad, to, to be able to deal with those situations Mm -hmm. because at at the highest level of competition, you don't know what's going to happen. That's why competitions are so exciting. Yeah. You don't really know what's going to happen. And it's really, some of it's chance, some of it's, uh, you know, a lot of it's subjective and you're only in control of so much. So I think this is just a good exercise in in all those lessons. Yeah. Those ones that can kind of hang back and, and just kind of go, go with the flow and say, look, it was supposed to happen now. It's going to be, 
you know, more than another year away, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go perform no matter what, when the time comes, I'll, I'll be ready. And it's, it's difficult to have that mindset, but I know a lot of athletes out there, especially at that highest level kind of naturally do, but it's a, it's a good point you make about competition. We, we have to stay primed for competition. Competition is a skill in itself and it's not something that you want to lose an edge on any amount. So it's certainly, you know, in, in weightlifting, and I'm sure it's it's true for every other sport as well, um, but weightlifting specifically, they're probably going to want to compete, even if it's just at, the, at a little local practice competition, at least two more times between now and then, if not three, maybe even four, you know, especially if... I would have never PR'd if competitions weren't a thing, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. I was garbage in the gym. <laughs> well, let's don't get in, into that, uh, Cheryl. D- um, Dave, Cheryl was famous for passing on her second or and or third clean and jerk attempt if she she because she usually won the competition right on her first clean and jerk attempt easily wow so she was uh notorious for just oh, like, i'm gonna I call it a day when you're good it's you're excusable good, right? when you're good you're it's good excusable she's a super heavyweight you know she's got <laughs> a worse. she's got a very tiny small bladder but she is a super heavyweight. there you go there you go it's yeah. your decision you want pee on the platform or do you want me to scratch my last wait tip? so chad you were saying that like the number of competitions that you guys would normally have throughout the year are two, three, maybe four. Is that right? And are they spaced out kind of, is there a season or are they kind of spaced out uh, throughout kind of quarterly? How would that normally be done? There's no real season, um, especially once you're on the highest level, you want to spread them out as much as you can. And, you know, usually international competitions and our national uh, competition calendar is pretty good about being uh, spread out enough. There have been occasions where, you know, a lot of us on the international teams would have to skip out on the national championships or something like that. I think there were a couple years there in the middle, which is the only reason why Cheryl has more national championships than I do. Did you see because... me start to smile? I was like, it's inappropriate. Don't interrupt him. He's trying to do a He'll podcast, Cheryl. Yeah. But He'll I bring it up himself. I know. <laughs> but, it's but I literally I... started to smile. I was yeah. like, is that your excuse? No, it, it is. Absolutely. And it's legit. <laughs> it's legit. And you know it, Cheryl. You know it. But no, it, it is, be- because, true. you know, I had to go to the international competition over the national championships or whatever other national competition it was. But you know, beyond that, it's usually um, two to three months uh, spread apart or a little bit more. Um, I would recommend, if at all possible, any athlete to have a minimum of two months between competitions, if at all possible, again, if not three. But I would say um, two to three major competitions a year is normal. And, you know, maybe one other small, smaller practice competition. Being that we have so many talented really young athletes in weightlifting now they're having to compete a lot more than that and so you know and I think their coaches and they have handled it pretty well I mean they've all been staying pretty healthy and and still performing at a very high level but you know when you have an athlete like uh, CJ Cummings and Harrison Morris who are both on uh, the top of the senior world um, when they were youth athletes they were going to youth worlds they were going to junior worlds they were going to senior worlds on top of competing at a national competition uh, here and there throughout the year. So, so, but why would a, so it's great to see that there are more um, athletes that are, you know, capable of competing at a higher level and more people interested in weightlifting, but what's the benefit of them competing more? Uh, like you're saying, like you're, they're having to compete more throughout the year. Why is that the case? I mean, wouldn't they all still um, kind of go to those three or four major competitions and, and compete equally well, the there? Benefit- yeah, the benefit is is one because they want the championships, you know, and they're capable. They, I mean, these kids that I'm talking about are capable of winning youth, junior worlds, and potentially potentially meddling at senior worlds. So it's like, you know, I can understand on on one hand if I'm that athlete or if I'm the coach of that athlete, hey, we don't know what's going to happen in another year. Uh, so you know, let's take it now while we're in shape and while we're um, ready and while we're capable of doing it. But there's also another benefit in, especially when you're a young athlete or you're an athlete, uh, maybe you're a master athlete actually that is fairly new to the sport and and you're interested in competing. One of the things that I recommend um, to some athletes, and it depends on the athlete and and how they handle competition, but if they struggle in competition, the benefit in them getting on that competition platform almost as much as possible is developing that skill of competing, um, getting more comfortable. If 
if you've been on a competition platform a hundred times, right? At some point it's going to become more comfortable, right? At some point it's going to be like, this is no big deal. Um, you know, and, and I'm glad that I'm pretty much at that point. I mean, I'm not saying that there's no nerves, but because I've been on the competition platform so many times when I go compete at, um, any competition at this point, I mean, it feels, honestly, it feels like home to me, you know, so we have to get athletes, whatever their, um, you know, their uh, natural tendencies are or their personality is or their struggle or what whatever talent they have on the competition platform, we have to either build that up or maintain it or mold it in some way. Makes right. sense. And it's a yeah. good way to see, um, like Chad mentioned, the, the master's athletes or your novice athletes to get them in there competing often. It's a really good diagnostic tool because you can see what what technique they're defaulting to when they're in that panic mode uh, they make more mistakes and you can kind of go back and and even for a skilled competitor it's still good to come back to the gym after a major competition and say okay well you screwed this up a couple of times or maybe not put it to your athlete in such words but um, <laughs> well, maybe that's what they need to hear make note of yeah. that right or maybe that's what they need to hear but you can make note of that and then you know use it um for your next training cycle. And it, and it depends too, I think on, like I competed a lot, like Chad said, there wasn't a youth category when I was competing, uh, but I would do junior world, senior worlds, junior nationals, senior nationals in, you know, Pan Ams and all the competitions in between. But I was also super heavyweight. Still am actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, what she's saying, but, Dave, is that she would have had all the youth championships and world records if there was a youth category that's what i heard when she said what she uh -huh, said uh -huh. i mean that's why chad's here he say <laughs> um no but it's uh i i wouldn't have to cut weight you know so some athletes have different and of course an athlete entering into a competition doesn't have to cut weight you can go up a weight class but there are some uh, other factors involved that i think allowed me to compete more often and some athletes to compete more often but yeah, with very few exceptions, especially like a world championship or an international stage, it's it's almost always a, a good idea to to take part in that and see where you're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's definitely a line as you're talking about there, Cheryl, especially with those athletes that have to cut weight and weightlifting. I mean, I experienced that last year. I, I was planning on, well, I wouldn't be able to now anyway, but I was planning on going another year of international masters competition. And honestly, uh, kind of burnt my body out and, uh, you know, mostly physically, but a little bit emotionally and, and mentally too. I did four competitions in the course of six months last year. Um, and one of them was just a little local meet that, that I had to do to qualify for uh, masters and, and regular nationals and everything else. But cutting weight was the biggest part of that. It was, it was very tough. So there's a line there that you don't want to cross. And so that's why I throw out that number of at least twice you know, within this, this time frame, but some of that depends on the individual and how they handle, um, competition physically, mentally, and emotionally. Do they need more practice? There's going to be some athletes that, um, I think their coaches would be very glad and happy for them to get a little bit more experience on the platform. This doesn't happen anymore, but it was in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Cheryl, if you remember, um, uh, as well, but, uh, Holly Mangold was her first international competition was the Olympic team that she made in 2012. Is that right? You know what? I mean, she was on the Olympic team in, in 2012. Yeah. Um, and I know she was a novice, but I don't know. That's a really excellent question. If that's the case, that's incredible. No, yeah. it was, it, and I couldn't remember which team she made, but I know it was her first international competition. And again, they have qualification wow. standards now to where that can't happen. But and, and I think she did okay, but man, I think she would have, you know, had potential to do better if she would have had some some practice there. But I wonder, Dave, is the situation similar in gymnastics? Again, if, if you were uh if you had an athlete that uh you were mentoring or coaching and you have more than a year left, would you say that in gymnastics just them practicing uh, those skills and drills and training is enough or do they need to get out there on the competition stage as well? 
competition floor matters. Uh, they need to prepare for what it's like to compete in front of people, to raise the hand in front of the judge, to make sure that you're putting yourself in a pressure situation. Uh, so we try to recreate that as much as possible when we're in a gym setting, you know, especially at the Olympic Training Center is kind of unique because, um, I mean, you guys know for having been there and lived there and things like that, but there's always tours going in throughout the day. Whenever there was a tour going in, we would take the whole tour in, sit them down and do a routine for them. And so 40, 50 people would give us an opportunity to say, okay, turn it on when there's somebody watching. So those kind of things are really important for us to be able to recreate pressure situations as much as possible. So um, normally the the mentality is that you want to have your routine set, meaning no adding of uh, new skills, potentially taking something out if uh, it's creating some issues, but no adding of new skills about six months prior to what you're training for. So from now, if we have, you know, 14, 15 months before 2021, you'll see guys continue to kind of use the next year in the same way that you, they used the previous year to, to lead up till 2020. So they'll, they'll learn new skills. They'll, you know, add them into their half routines, test them out into routines, then see how they go in the fall uh, and in the winter in, t- in terms of competing them. Uh, competition season normally starts around December. And um, then they'll see whether or not they're worth keeping in. And then from December through to Olympic trials, they'll be refining. Uh, For the guys that are on the collegiate teams, they're competing almost every weekend. Mm -hmm. And the collegiate guys have a really, really brutal schedule. And there are some guys in the collegiate system that have a legitimate shot of being on the Olympic team. And they have a much different training regimen than the guys that are out of college that are just living at the training center or, or training at a local club gym that are in the running. So uh, it is very different between being an NCAA athlete uh, who's competing maybe 14 times over the course of one uh, Mm -hmm. winter season versus, you know, uh, a guy who's at the Olympic Training Center that's maybe competing six or seven times uh, between local competitions and international competitions leading up to the trial process. Now, in in your experience, it just, it kind of brought an interesting topic in mind when you talk about the frequency of competition especially for the collegiate athlete now for me I was a very emotional lifter and what I mean by that is that a competition would knock me down um and I, like you were talking about earlier Cheryl even if I went and trained with a group of people because I did most of my training on my own so if I went and trained with a group of people it would it would tag my CNS a little bit differently right it would be more emotional for me so I had to recover more from that side of it, CNS-wise, emotion-wise, than really my muscles, right, than, than physically or anything else like that. Did you see any of your teammates or athletes that you knew, Dave, in, in gymnastics, um, you know, handle competition different in that regard, or did they compete so often that that kind of died away a little bit? No, I mean, it's pretty brutal. Um, I mean, when you're 18 to 20 years old and you're in college, you, you're more resilient than you are when you're 25 plus. Uh, so you can kind of handle the stress of competing that often. But, you know, the college coaches are smart when it comes to making sure they understand um, peaking at the right time and peaking at NCAAs. So what you'll see is um, guys... Uh, who are the top guys maybe competing a little bit less earlier in the season and then testing out some new skills, maybe just doing exhibitions on a few events rather than doing the all-around. And then towards the end of the season, you'll see them ramp up a little bit more just so that they're prepping to peak at the right time. So uh, it, I completely agree with you in terms of um, tax being taxing on the CNS when you're in a setting that's different than your daily tra- training. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when we would have national team camps and we would go to OTC when I wasn't living there and we would go and the whole national team would go and train together. Those weeks of training were the most devastating weeks of training of my entire life, mentally, physically, emotionally. And they were incredible. Like we would learn sk- new skills like like this and you're you're on point for eight hours a day mm-hmm. trying to make sure that, you know, you're showing that you're capable and uh, of being around these guys and it's incredibly draining. You leave and you need like three weeks to recover. Yeah. It, it's incredibly taxing. So I completely agree with you. When you put yourself in a situation where you're around those other guys and you're all vying for the same spot, that it pushes you in a way that you're not able to get when you're on your own. Mm-hmm. And that's really the, the biggest thing that I, I would do knowing what I know now. If I was an athlete in the situation of, okay, we're postponed a year, 
I would really just start over. I would give myself some time um, outside of the gym. I would, I mean, CrossFit wasn't around back then, but I would do some CrossFit. I would make sure that I'm as completely recovered um, emotionally. Uh, my CNS is is uh, recovered. Uh, my my maybe adrenals have have uh, been replenished. All that stuff before I went back into a cycle, and then I would ease in for a longer period of time than I physically felt like I needed to, and I would take that time to make sure that I'm recovered and just take things really slow. And I hope that's similar to what um, you know a lot of these athletes are do, will do because what I mentioned earlier. If you qualified for the team and that was done, it was an it was emotional. It was very emotional for you, at least to some sort of extent. So, I th- hope that they factor that into the equation and really take some time to recover from that part of it. And you mentioned that you guys took advantage of the tours that came out there. That's really cool. That's that's interesting to hear that you guys did that and you were able to use that for your training. And uh, oh, yeah. Cheryl Cheryl put on her own little shows for the tours at the training center. Is that right, Cheryl? You want to tell us about that? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, what are you talking about? Is there some story? <laughs> I think I told I Dave know, about this but... before. Were you, were you guys ever at the center at <laughs> the same that, time? That, I don't Matt? even know. I think we were. So, so Dave, were you not no, ever invited into one of uh, Cheryl's uh, <laughs> drinking cricket games? Oh, no. Uh, oh, oh, I, this is the, no, I the wasn't there. That, I wasn't there for yeah. this. And I definitely would have seen it because I think you would have probably done it right outside of my window, right on the grass where oh, he's yeah, there. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> From my bedroom. Yeah, no, it was, it's the, uh, it's the story that Matt Fraser likes to, t- to tell people that, um, at the, at the Olympic Training Center. And you're exactly right, Dave. Uh, on a serious note, I loved when the tour groups would come by. I'd be like, finally, somebody that doesn't mm. get to see this very often. So, you know, like, I like that that tension is good for me. It, like, makes me super focused because I don't want to look like an idiot. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, so so it really, those, those are very, very useful, um, those tours and those opportunities. And, and I'm really excited you guys were able to take advantage in such a a real way. Um, But what we're talking about now is um, there was a a period of time where I was really injured and I didn't have really much to do. So during the summertime, because there's not tons to do anyway at the training center, you eat, you sleep, you train. Some people go to school. I I had a bachelor degree at that moment. So I was like, ah, school schmool. So I would set up croquet and this luxurious grass that the Olympic training center had, it was just begging to get played in. So we'd set up the wickets and, but they, they had also opened up a, a rec center, which had a beautiful pool and ping pong table, the whole nine yards. So I would just be in my bathing suit going from the swimming pool to the croquet course that I set up that nobody was allowed to touch. Like maintenance is like, <laughs> we're trying to do stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. it's fine. So just mow around it. Um, but we would, uh, so I'd be in my bathing suit more often than not, maybe smoking a cigar right next to that sign that says, do not smoke. This is like, like Olympic athletes live here and I got a snow game in my mouth. But, but um, Matt said that, cause I would rope whoever was walking around to play with me. So I don't care if you're a speed skater. What are you doing right now? Nothing. Come over here. You're learning how to play croquet. So I'd have this hodgepodge and Matt was with me once. He said, Cheryl, my favorite part of that whole thing was when this tour group came by and they were, (laughs) and they just, cause it was, they couldn't avoid me. So the tour guide was like, and there's, you know, Olympic bronze medalist Cheryl Hayworth. And I just. In her natural habitat. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Full on bathing suit, croquet mallet in one hand. And I was like, hey, what's up, everybody? So that's yeah. that's one of the funniest stories I've ever heard, seriously. Like And it's true. And I love and to hear true. you tell it. I'm gonna have to have you tell me that every now and then just, just to hear it because you know, you gotta envision this is the Olympic training center. This is a tour group, you know, that that's coming there, seeing the center, you right. know, coming to, to kind of hang out with with the athletes and here Cheryl is over there well, it, it's nice for them to see though USA <laughs> practice it's nice yeah. for them to see that the athletes are real people yeah. and we have you know things that we enjoy outside of the gym too and it's I think it's kind of cool for them they probably enjoy that yeah. it, yeah. it truly was an extension of my home yeah yeah <laughs> it's, this is well, what I'm, I'm glad in Georgia 
<laughs> I'm glad you're so comfortable. I'm glad you're so I got a, I got a question for you guys. Um, with regards to, you know, you saying that, um, you know, the team had been selected. You had been told the athletes. Yeah. Are you allowed to say who those athletes were? And what if the Olympics was to be held, uh, how did you think that those athletes would have performed uh, come August? Do you think that they had kind of a squad that would have had some potential? Oh, absolutely. And I think we can spit those out, Cheryl. I, I think that those were released on our recording, right? I think I think we had the record yeah. button going when, when Phil said it. Yeah, um, I don't think there's any reason we can't um, mention them. So what did he say? Uh, off of, together we can do this. It's, I think uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Catherine, Knight. Well, how many how many spots how many spots for first? Let's see. It was, I uh, believe, a full team, right, of eight. Yeah. So four, four. women, four men. Yeah. We got um, Catherine Nye, Sarah Robles, Kane Wilkes, yep. um, Harrison Morris, C.J. Cummings. We have uh, De La Cruz. West, oh, Wes Kitts, yep. Jordan De La Cruz. Did and I name one, an extra person? There's no, there's I one, think it's more, one more, one more girl, um, female. Oh, Maddie, Maddie Rogers. Maddie, duh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So an incredibly um, strong team, mm-hmm. and did we just do that, Chad? Did we just actually? I, I do think that? we. I'm you know what? Us, we could be wrong. I was like, oh, I'm gonna need some ham. I was and you know what's so like... sad about that is that we we're the host of the official USA Weightlifting podcast, and we, and we don't sure know are. that well enough, right? We it's all new be, information. Just blame it on the virus. Yeah, exactly. You got a little it's touch of it, I guess, up. right? It's, it's caused <laughs> yeah. you to be forgetful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, an incredibly strong team. I think, Dave, most of those individuals, aside from maybe just a f- Jordan, maybe have meddled at a world competition. Hmm. Um, and I could be yeah. wrong there. Jordan, I think, is medal at Pan Ams and stuff like that. But as far as a world championship, um, and even Sarah was uh, an Olympic medalist. Um, so, you know. So, so this potentially could have been one of the stronger squads in the last few Olympic Games then. It's by and far the strongest squad that oh, we've yeah. probably maybe ever had. If if I don't know if I can say ever because USA was, was on top way back in the when, I don't know, 60s, 70s. Um, Mm -hmm. something like that, but it's been a long time, uh, since we've had even one individual, um, that was, that was capable, uh, or I guess a couple being that Cheryl Hayworth, we're talking to Cheryl Hayworth right now, who (laughs) won a a bronze medal in 2000. I'm going to start taking this personally. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? But but it's uh, an excellent weightlifting. That's a really great, um, question, uh, Dave, that, uh, but we talk often too, that, um, these, these athletes are so accomplished already in their own rights as weightlifters that being said if they if we had to make a b weightlifting team from those people Mm. who didn't qualify it would still be a really good weightlifting team it would be incredible to watch those folks too yeah i guess that's a little frustrating right saying like man we finally have a team that we're really proud to put out there and see how well they're going to perform internationally does for this particular squad, in terms of their age, in terms of the potential to gain experience and maybe get stronger over the course of the next year, does 2021 bode well for them to perform better, you think, internationally? Or is it going to be kind of detrimental to them in terms of their performance come another year onto their training? Yeah. I for this particular most, I see team. Them, yeah. I see them doing really, really well. Yeah. I see them doing really well. I don't think we have anybody, in, and we know that we keep pushing the limits of what um, an old weightlifter is. For example, Chad Vaughn almost winning the national championships just last year. Let me check my imaginary watch here, but uh, you're we were not watching a that young live guy. at Power Monkey yeah. Camp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so I don't think, unless you have some pre existing injury where you're just like, man, I can't wait until this is over. Um, but I, I would say that not only is our team, uh, I mean, you mentioned Jordan De La Cruz. Um, and Catherine Nye, for example, they are still physically young, like they are young people, but even the, the older athletes on the team, I don't, I don't see them having any kind of expiration date or, whoa, you know, uh, Sarah Robles needs to lift this year because she's just not going to have it next year. I don't think that's the case. Uh, sorry to cut you off, um, Chad. 
I do that a lot. Oh, no, I, you know I'm used to that. I mean, that's the, the whole USA Weightlifting podcast is, is Cheryl cutting me off. But I think I waste um, way more time apologizing for cutting you off. I know. You, yeah, I you really do. Keep it moving. Um, but yeah, no, Sarah would be the only one that really comes to mind as far as any even somewhat potential. I mean, how old is Sarah, Cheryl? She's got to be. Uh, I think she's in her early 30s. Yeah. Um, I'm I mean, not so, exactly sure. Yeah, but she is, you know, in incredibly good shape and she has been for the last uh, couple of years. Um, and, you know, I'm confident that she can maintain that as well. But she would be the only one that's kind of on the edge there. Um, and everyone else is just kind of at the top of their game. I guess I do worry about Kate a little bit too, even though she's very young. She's been so on fire that I think she would have been able to take that into, um, you know, 2020 Olympic Games, which would have been coming up pretty quickly. Um, But she's such a good competitor. And, um, you know, uh, we talked to her before, Cheryl, a great person and mentally very strong as well. So I think she'll be able to handle it too. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But she did have a really good, and that's the thing, like, uh, but what I would do if I were in her position, like, man, I was on fire. I was about to win this thing too. Um, I would say, okay, well, well, everybody is in the same situation that yeah. I'm in. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. um, it, it may be like, ah, oh, she's going to wish that she had the opportunity just to kind of put the cherry on top of the, the last couple of years that she's had. Um, you know, but you're right. She's an incredible competitor, uh, on its own and she's going to be successful no matter what happens, I think, or that should be her attitude. For sure. And yeah, all these athletes, I mean, if you're a champion, you're a champion, you know, you're, you're going to find a way to, to make it happen. And I think all these athletes are, uh, in that boat. I think the last thing that I kind of want to cover here, unless you have anything else, Dave, is, and I don't know if this came to me in a dream, if this is a, a bad dream that I had or something. So um, maybe one of you guys know is the we we're talking about the training center. Is there some sort of controversy going on with the training center? Did you make a post about that, Cheryl? Uh, the actual Olympic training center yeah. itself? Um, yeah. No, uh, but there the recent post, if you're talking about the most recent Facebook yeah. post was just. Um, the US OPC um, asking Congress for $200 uh, million, I think. And the big, the controversy is that, well, if, if you're really looking at the breakdown and, and the, the argument for the US OPC was so, so that we can help support our athletes through this time, mm-hmm. uh, but just the framework of how everything trickles down, how much the executives get paid, et cetera. There's just, we, we all know that uh, athletes aren't very well supported. Um, It's getting better. I think as far as NGBs are concerned, I'm extremely proud of USA weightlifting and all, you know, under uh, Phil Andrews' leadership, he's very well respected amongst other people who are trying to really bring about change and make the whole thing athlete centric. Which is, you know, we we are why this this institution exists, and it's it was mandated by Congress. So a lot of folks, including myself, um, really want to encourage people to support um, a bill that's been proposed where they they actually have to. Um, or should rewrite the bylaws because yeah. it, it it doesn't favor the athletes at all. Um, athletes are routinely taken advantage of in, in every possible way. And um, yeah, so that's what that was about. It was just a little, um, a little breakdown of where that money would actually go. And is it really truly mm-hmm. for the athletes or just a shameless attempt to, to get something? From, from I, I think it's also important to to note on there, and so people kind of can understand uh, that the USOPC is one of the only governing bodies in the entire world. Maybe I think one other uh, that is not government funded. Right. So us asking for us USOPC asking for two hundred million dollars for the government is actually a really big deal because yeah. the. The Olympic program in the U.S. is funded by donations, by sponsorships, by TV. 
and by um the that that's basically it by the donations yeah. of you know people who love the olympics and by tv rights and by the sponsors and that's how you know we raise enough money to be able to fund our olympic program so you know us asking, asking congress for 200 million dollars one shows how much of a, a, a you know the losing out in the olympics is going to impact all of uh, the the sports and and the loss of the TV rights and things like that, but um, I'm really interested. I haven't seen that breakdown. I think that's really critical in terms of where that money is going to be going, so that it does benefit the athletes as much as possible. I think that's a completely separate podcast on its own, just mm-hmm. to talk about oh, yeah, you know um, you know all those issues that go along with uh, being a struggling athlete, uh, struggling Olympic athlete, and thinking that it's um, you know living the high life uh, when in reality you know uh, you end up having three additional jobs just to be able to kind of mm-hmm. um, make it through um, and be the best in the world at something. So it is a very interesting topic and something that would be great for another conversation. But um, I'm interested in, if you can send us that link too, I think we'd be able to put it on here sure. so people can kind of see exactly um, what that article is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's an excellent point, Dave. I don't think a lot of people realize that, uh, you know, the USOPC relies exclusively on donations and and people uh you know private supporters so uh that's a really good point and and this is uncharted waters right so Mm -hmm. um you know and whether or not it's legitimate you know who knows it's just the hope that you know uh it is for the athletes and it it is an interesting article um but i I believe it was a washington post article but i'll make sure that uh, you guys have access to that for sure awesome yeah yeah, another critical part of this whole thing that I don't know how I haven't even thought of that yet, but these athletes, you know, my mind is, is immediately going to what are they going to do in training? How are they going to handle this mentally and physically and emotionally? But they have to financially make it between here and there. Uh, they have to be supported in that way as well, and that's really in the end what we're talking about. And, you know, any listeners out there that can potentially um, – uh, help support in that way, you know, maybe you can, uh, we can provide a link in that regard as well, uh, because we do rely on, um, donations and, um, more than anything to, to be able to support the athletes. And again, this unique situation that we have going here where we're postponed for over a year, uh, we got to find a way to support the athletes that, that have done the right things and done the job, uh, and, and made the team. And hopefully again, like we talked about earlier, those te- those teams will stay uh, what they were I, at the Olympic Training Center. The you know all the buildings house different sports things like that. And uh, I remember going uh, from the cafeteria and walking down to the gymnastics gym every day, and you pass the pool, and the pool is like you know on the way towards um, kind of the front of the training center. And there's a plaque on the wall there that says, "This building was paid for by the selling of Olympic coins." to people around the US. So those types of things, those those Olympic coins and and different donations actually fund, you know, a lot of the projects that are done at the Olympic Training Center at the various locations that we have, but uh, I always saw that and I was like, wow, like people buying those coins and, and you know supporting the Olympics through uh, those donations have such an impact. So I mean, if there's I know everybody's very tight on this particular situation right now that we're going through with funds but um the olympians are no different and uh, come 2021 i know it's going to be a big deal in terms of do the athletes have enough in their pocket to be able to sustain training uh, the yeah. way they need to to be able to perform well yep 100 percent. so yeah buy, uh, buy some gonna... fuzzy socks with the olympic rings on it because it really does matter <laughs> Fuzzies, like yeah. you're absolutely right yeah yeah absolutely well, we're uh, to the place where we can start wrapping up now. And and Dave, you know, I'll I think I'll take the honor of asking the question this time. Our main question that we're keeping a tally of here, Cheryl, and it's it's very very important, Come and it's on, very Cheryl. important that you answer correctly. I've never been so nervous. You should in be. My life. You should be. <laughs> All right, here it is. What is the better sport or discipline, gymnastics or weightlifting? Better, define better. better. See, what? this is what happens. I want to negotiate. I want to. I want to push the limitations. I can't just give a simple answer. Well, obviously, weightlifting. There you go. Okay. Um, I mean, that goes without saying. But I feel like you know, there's there might be something to this gymnastics thing. Yeah. You know, Thanks, I don't know sure. why anybody that. wants to spend that much time inverted. But hey, <laughs> to each his own. 
Uh, well, no, I'll take that. I'll take awesome. that. It's actually a point of pride of mine to to spout off uh, Chad's favorite fact, which is becoming my favorite fact that, that weightlifters are the second most mobile athletes yeah. at the Olympic mm-hmm. Games, just mm-hmm. just behind, slightly uh, the behind. Gym. Yeah. Yeah, you not this gymnast, not this gymnast, but well, some yeah, gymnast. I, I have been able to confirm that we're a little more flexible in at least a couple areas of our body in general. So um, that's that's good to know yeah, as well. But I thank you. Get the foot <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, uh, Cheryl for those might of you be not watching the video. Cheryl just put her head, her her foot behind her head. Yeah, Cheryl may be more flexible close. than the average gymnast. I, I think. That's uh, I think so. The case. I think so. Absolutely. Absolutely, she can do the splits, no problem. Without even doing any training for years, you can still drop down into the splits, right? There's there's going to be an expiration date to that, I feel like. I feel like <laughs> I I'm going to come jogging from behind the curtain at Power Monkey Camp, drop yeah. into a split, and you guys are going to hear, and stuck. like, Uh-oh. snap, snap. Yeah, and I'm just going to have to tuck and roll off so that Chad can come through the curtain. Exactly. Can well, somebody Cheryl... move Cheryl's corpse out of the way, please. <laughs> right. Trying to do intros. So so Dave doesn't land on you when, when he comes out and, and exactly. does a flip or whatever. Yeah. Or maybe but... he would rather have that than the barbell. I like how Chad Yeah, that was that was the bad one. You. Landing on the barbell, yeah. yeah. I tried my best to take him out for the week. I mean, you know, but the <laughs> weightlifters really were gonna take over camp if, if that would have happened. But <laughs> soon enough. Um, I do appreciate that you're on, Cheryl, because you'll be sad to know that you're probably only the second person besides me that has said weightlifting second or maybe third even Cerbus didn't say weightlifting what so yeah yeah well he, he gave it a he, he gave it a uh weightlift and gymnastics yeah as you would expect from mike it's uh it's oh, been gosh. pretty rough trying to be all diplomatic yeah what a jerk of course <laughs> well so that's we'll we'll tally that one uh on my side there dave for sure well um, weightlifting is maybe, that sport because, like, when you win weightlifting, you get to be the strongest, right? And, you know, yep. Citius, Saltius, Fortius, right? So, that's right. Fortius, that's not the, what do you, what do you, what title do you get to be the most f- flippiest, the, the I don't, bounciest? I don't know if that's, I don't know if flippiest is I'm Latin the bounciest. For, it for should be. <laughs> it should flippiest be part of that, that motto, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. We'll so, that's what, we'll like, a suggestion. That's the tiebreaker for me is that like you just get to be the strongest, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So. It all depends on your mindset and your, but I'm a and your physical goals, so. right? Yeah. It's for true. sure. I, I have no desire to do flips. I just I don't. <laughs> I don't I don't care. Uh, I'm okay with handstand push ups, you know. I don't really care to stand on my hands for as long as Dave does though. I'd rather <laughs> pause in the bottom of a squat. That's where I wanna be. So I tried to do a regular push up the other day and it didn't go well. Do you have that on video, by the way, that we can? You know what? It was an here. Instagram story. I was like, I had finished my workout. Um, I was squatting, and I think I did some push presses. And I was like, three people challenged me to this push up thing. Let me just go ahead. And I was already cheating too. So I was up, <laughs> like my upper body was a little bit higher, and I just, I, I was a thousand percent confident I was going to get at least one. And then by the time I got here, I was like, you're not. The closer the floor got to my face, the more I knew I wasn't going in the other direction. So I just had to give up and like stop the recording awkwardly and post that. It was, it was pretty great. We definitely need, need that recording that. and put I it know. up on here. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I need for to sure. see that video. Definitely. It was pretty good. Yeah. All right. Cheryl, are you ready for the random question game? So I've got a couple here in line for you. And if, okay. if there's not, if there's one that you don't like, you can pass to Dave and he has to answer. But you have to answer at least two. Are you ready? I I guess so. I guess so, Chad. What sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise do you love? Ooh, you know what? I I really do. Um, and this isn't like the funniest or whatever, but I really find uh, running water very relaxing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when I'm near, like you know, like fountains or rivers or the ocean. Um, it's quite soothing for me. Uh, and that was, sorry to give you a real answer and nothing. Um, <laughs> no, that's good. Cause I, if I, if I had enough time to think I'd come up with all kinds of stuff, but, but running water, I think is one of my, my favorite sounds. Nice. I like it. Do you ever, uh, like fall, fall asleep to that? Um, I've had occasion to, and, and I try those, um, those like, um, 
noise machines or whatever, like the white noise. And those are okay, but there's nothing like um, the real thing. None of that fake water. Yeah. None of that recorded yeah. water noise. I want, I want the real thing. Like in the bathtub, like when I take a bath, which I take yeah. baths all the time. I was actually texting uh, with Rika the other day and she's like are you you're taking another bath i'm like it's all i do so now she jokes either i'm napping <laughs> taking a bath or <laughs> pretending to work out um but i just i i love hearing the water run so if i can make it just like a trickle so that it does it for longer hmm. you know so i'm always trying to figure out how to work that yeah, I'm such a weirdo there you go. next question no that and that actually brings me to my next question but i wanted to say some of the best naps that I've ever had have been in a weight room where there's constant bumper plates hitting the platform. I I guess I've just been around it so much. It's you so would. relaxing to me. And I, it's, it's, I need a recording of that so I can go to sleep to clanging, clanging plates every night, I think. <laughs> yeah. But Probably there, similar is, for but there you. is like the, the noise of a good lift. Like when you, cause yeah. you've been behind the curtain before, like, you know, waiting for your next attempt and your competitor is on the competition platform. You don't really know what's happening. You can just hear it. Um, In that situation, nothing sounds better than a missed lift. But in the gym, when I'm coaching my athletes and they're behind me or whatever, you can hear when it's good. I like Mm -hmm. that noise too. Like the feet moving nice and crisp, the butt, you know, there's no delay anywhere. Uh, There's something to be said for that. Absolutely. Um, all right, next question, and maybe you've answered this already. On a scale of 1 to 10, how weird are you and why? Weird. You know what? Um, I'd probably say I'm somewhere between a 7 and an 8, but I think everybody else is too. They just don't want to admit to it. That's really what it For is. For sure. How comfortable with are you with answering this question is what that really yeah. means. Uh, <laughs> it, it is. It's like, how comfortable how are you wearing are you? your bikini, smoking a stogie, <laughs> right. playing croquet <laughs> out in the grass? That is the real question. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, you know what? You know everybody wants You're... to be doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like nobody. So I understand that, that people, people are, have a lot of hangups and they don't want to appear such a way, but we're, I mean, I'm just doing what everybody else really wants to do. You know, it's like, there you go. why do you get to not wear a bra? Like you don't have to wear a bra. <laughs> you just choose to wear a bra. That's not my problem. <laughs> I am yep. wearing a bra right now. Or why do you take baths? Everybody wants to take a bath. Did everybody Cheryl just the to... one that yes. admits it? Right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. They embrace I'll it. I'll admit that too. For a man, I probably take more baths than I should, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> nope. All right. There's Cheryl, uh, thank, thank you so much for being on with us. Um, I know the listeners are going to get a, a lot of that, lot out of that and enjoy hearing from you. Do you have any last minute um, comments? Well, first of all, thank you, um, Dave and Chad. Chad, I think I have to talk to you on the phone immediately after this This is right. over uh, for other reasons. But I, uh, yeah, it's an honor. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I'm really feeling some sadness that I can't see my, my fellow Power Monkey uh, campers and coaches, but we'll, we'll yeah. all get through this together. It's one of those times where you just got to go with the flow, control what you can, and just let everything else happen and uh, enjoy the ride and stay safe. Keep washing those hands. Yeah, agreed. That that's the that's probably the best advice right now is keep washing those hands. But also, guys, be sure to head over to PowerMonkeyFitness.com for services and upcoming events. Check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at PowerMonkeyFitness, at Dave Durante, and at Ollie Chad. We'd also love to hear from you guys. Uh, send us an email to podcast at PowerMonkeyFitness.com. Let us know who you want to hear from, what you want us to talk about. If you have any questions you'd like us to answer on the show, we'd love to do that. On behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host, I'm Chad Vaughn, with Dave Durani, and until next time, thank you all for listening.